You are listening to The Gateway Church, located in Ferrisburg, Michigan. You can learn more about us by visiting thegateway.church or like and follow us on Facebook, where you can watch full services, keep up with all that is going on, and get connected. Thank you. Okay, so shortly after applying and being accepted with our organization, a certain portion of Scripture... um, really became impressed on me in my personal quiet time, and we felt like the Lord was highlighting this for us to hold on to and uh, be faithful to. And so as a result, I, uh, I committed to memory, and we're going to begin by, um, it'll be up on the screen as well, but we'll, we'll read through this chunk of scripture, and then I'm going to unpack three brief points from it that we can learn from. So it is from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verses 18 through chapter 2, 5. And it says this, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the wisdom of God and the power of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not, so that he might nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before him. But by his doing you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom proclaiming to you the testimony of God, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. That's the section. So, there are three things that I want to briefly pull out from from this, that the Lord has been speaking to us. And the first is this. It's that the message of the cross is the power of God to save people. The power of the cross is that Jesus' death 2,000 years ago is enough to both fully forgive you for what you've done and completely transform who you are. It is the only thing that can change your identity before God. And that's what everybody needs is a new identity. What we don't fundamentally need is uh, behavior change, but that's the fruit that comes. It comes from identity change. Like I said in the first service, it sounds like Like, this is Gospel 101, and it is Gospel 101. But one thing that I'm learning is that Gospel 101 is the first class you're in, and then you stay in Gospel 101 all the way until the very end, and you end on Gospel 101. And life is a process of going back to Gospel 101. So the cross forgives, and it transforms you. But I want to just unpack that with a couple brief scriptures. So let's talk about this. The cross forgives you, and let's look at Ephesians 1.7. In him, that is, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, the things we've done. Revelation 1.5 says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. A uh, little word picture I'd Drop my mind is like if if you're a vigilante, let's say, you're on the run, there's wanted posters for you, that life of looking over your shoulder for who's watching and what's coming after you for, you know, 
what you've done. And now imagine you're absolved and you're forgiven, and then you don't need to live on the run anymore. In the, in the spirit, that's what the Lord does through the cross. Imagine the relief. We are forgiven from our trespasses and our sins. So that's what the cross does, and it's only part of the story because it not only forgives what we've done, but the other thing that needs to happen is it needs to transform who we are. In John 8, we read of an interaction between Jesus and the Jews that followed him. And it's where Jesus said this phrase that a lot of us know, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And uh, that is often an encouraging verse to us, but they were not encouraged when they heard it. They were offended. They said, we are Jews and children of Abraham and we are not anybody's slave, was their response. And Jesus was trying to show them that they were enslaved, but it was to sin. That's when he said, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. That's our condition before Jesus. And so what is the way that God deals with our slavery to sin? To that sin that keeps, maybe keeps overcoming your life or our life. It's not by taking, at this point yet, sin or temptation out of the picture, but by taking us out of the picture. And what I mean by that is by crucifying us on the cross with him. Because you can only be a slave if you're alive. Like it says in Romans 6, our old self was crucified with him 2,000 years ago in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. So if you're in Christ, you were a slave to sin, it reigned and it ruled your life, it had a chain around your neck, but God has set you free by putting you to death with Jesus and making you a new person that no longer has that chain around their neck, that is no longer slave's victim overcome by it. So the message of the cross is the power of God because it is God's singular way of forgiving us and transforming us. And so as we go, we want to determine, like Paul, and here this morning in Spring Lake, is this technically Spring Lake or Ferrysburg? We were wondering. Okay, Ferrys, you were talking about the way here. Like, wait, are we in Ferrysburg or Spring Lake? So even today in Ferrysburg, we determined to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified because it deals with our every need before God and in the Arab world where this message is not proclaimed in large part. In fact, they're taught the opposite, that Jesus did not die for sin on the cross, that that, in fact, um, though it appeared to be, it wasn't. And it's the very message that's needed. So that's point one. Point two is this, that God has chosen to work uniquely among the despised of the world. So listen again to this part that I recited where he said, For consider your calling, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world and the despised. God has chosen the things that are not, so that he might nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before him. I think sometimes uh, in missions, at least in my experience, It's tempting to adopt a strategy that if the influential and the powerful people in the community get saved, they'll bring the others with them, and it'll be great, and it would be great, and the intentions are good, and may it be, but I'm also reminded at the same time what Paul is saying here, and let's not lose sight of the fact of the principle in the kingdom of God that he has chosen the despised in the eyes of the world and not the influential to see his kingdom primarily spread through. That's his strategy. And so as I think about it, you either come to Christ because you are foolish in the world, or you come to Christ and you become foolish in the world. In Matthew 9, 36 through 38, there's a a section here that we know well because it's a famous missions passage where Jesus says the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. But I want to read the full context because it's important this morning for what we're talking about. And this is I caught this for the first time maybe a year ago, and it's it's like I never saw it before. It says this, seeing the people, 
he, Jesus, felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. The point is this, that it was in the context of seeing a distressed and dispirited crowd that Jesus then identified that there was a harvest field among them, amongst the distressed and the dispirited. Think about like David's cave of Adullam and all the people that came to him up there. It said all the people that were bitter of soul and distressed and dispirited came to him at the cave of Adullam, and from there he got most of his mighty men. So, as we look toward where the kingdom of God will spread and the gospel will be received, let's expect to see God move among the weak and the not influential in the world. That's, that applies here in Ferrysburg and over to the Arab world, where the despised and the poor in the world are living in darkness. So that's our second point. God has chosen the despised of the world in a unique way. And the third point is this. Uh, what I call but have not coined the phrasing of the ministry of proclamation and demonstration. So listen to these words of Paul again. He said, My message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Paul relied upon the manifested, validating power of God in his ministry, not because it was impressive or made for a good newsletter, but because he wanted the Corinthians to trust God's power over theirs, his, or others' wisdom and understanding. I sometimes think of this word picture in my mind that if God's, the kingdom of God was like a class that you went to, it wouldn't be so much like a university lecture hall where you sit there and take notes. It would kind of be like walking into a first grade show and tell day. Because, or sometimes tell and show, because sometimes the message proceeds or the demonstration proceeds, but they both go together. And so it appears to me that Paul's approach with the Corinthians was simply to pre present Jesus and him crucified, to know nothing else, and then to demonstrate its validity by a demonstration of the indwelling spirit that was with him. And it wasn't Paul showboating, and it wasn't hysteria, and it wasn't manipulation of people or the power of suggestion, but it confirmed the message of Jesus and him crucified. And it gave the Corinthians a tangible experience by which they could know and trust God's power in their lives. And so it's like in my imagination, it's like I can hear Paul saying, you know, going and presenting the gospel and then saying something on along the lines of, now let me show it to you. Let me show you something with an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And so we don't consider ourselves as having arrived at that same place where Paul was in terms of operating as consistently, you know, it would seem in, in the demonstration of the Spirit, but it's the Scripture and others that compels and motivates our desire to pick up this kind of ministry and to operate in this kind of way. So, Let's determine that again. Here, all this applies to here in Ferrysburg, and it applies to the Arab world. And so let's determine it as well. So, there's our three points. I'm going to recap them again. I'm going to recap them with three we determine statements as we go, or as we go into Ferrysburg, or as we go to the Arab world. I'm going to say it this way. We determine to know nothing but Jesus and him crucified. We determine to remember the weak and the despised in the eyes of the world. And we determine to pursue a show-and-tell ministry. And this, these three things, this is how Paul, who had determined to bring Christ where he was not named in the earth, chose by inspiration of the Holy Spirit to operate in these ways. And so today we want to pick up this same mantle and determine to walk in those same steps and there are still many places in the world that need the next Paul or the next person from West Michigan, Ferrysburg, or the Gateway Church to come bearing simply the message of Jesus and him crucified with the Spirit, the indwelling Spirit. The Arab world today has over 400 million people and less than 1% Christian, like Jennifer was saying. 
So today, if you feel like you've been on the sidelines, if you feel like the Lord is stirring or has spoken or is speaking, let's ask this question, seek the Lord, and say, in what ways can you partake in this call? That's there for all of us. With that, I'm going to hand it back off. Awesome. Let's give it up for Marcus and Jennifer. Thank you guys so much. Worship team, you can go ahead and come on up. And man, uh, when he was uh, reading just in second service about foolish things, I was reminded of just some dumb things I would do as a kid. And uh, one of those things, and my dad would actually get mad, mad at me all the time for doing this, but uh, um, in Indiana growing up, uh, we had yellow jackets. Do we have yellow jackets here in Michigan? Okay, yeah, yeah. So they, they put holes in the ground, and, um, and what I would do is I would cover up those holes with a piece of wood, and then um, the yellow jackets would kind of swarm around there, and my dad would go over there and be like, he didn't want that because he would mow, and he'd get around it, and then he'd get stung, and it just wasn't good. And so finally, one time, I, I covered the hole up. A bunch of yellow jackets were around it, and uh, he was like, hey, you're going to be the one who uncovers that. And I was like, man, I have to clean up my mess that I made. And so I went and I uh, quickly as a kid, I just like kicked it over and uh, I ran away, ran up to the front porch. And uh, when I got up there, I, like, I was running, I had my hands closed. And when I opened my hand, uh, a bee came out and stung my eye. And I feel like a message like this just stings to the side. Because it's a great reminder uh, for us that we should be preaching the good news. It should sting us. That when we're in our workplaces or when we're in our families, we should speak Jesus. I mean, just some points that, uh, some little nuggets that he said is uh, the word of God needs to be transformed, needs to transform who you are. And that reminds me of Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is alive and powerful it is sharper than any, uh, sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our, our innermost thoughts and desires. The word of God is powerful, and it should transform us. Another thing he said that was challenging was identity change leads to behavior change. When we have the word of God inside of us, it changes us, and maybe it leads to behavior changes. And it was a good, great reminder as well that when we came to Christ, it was because of our identity change. So when we speak Jesus to other people, we shouldn't expect a behavior change. We should expect identity change. So go ahead and stand with me. We're going to respond to this in song. And just as he said, in what ways can you partake in the call? This call is something that you are constantly going to ask yourselves. In what ways can you partake of this call? And for students, it's preaching the good news at their schools. For you, it might be preaching the good news in your workplace or in your family or wherever uh, you rub shoulders with. And just even a couple weeks ago, we stood up in response to who's that one person that you can reach. And so again, who's that one person that you need to share the gospel with to help you partake in the call of speaking Jesus in people's lives? So let's go ahead and pray, and we're going to respond in the song. Jesus, we just thank you. Lord, for this message and how you've called Marcus and Jennifer and how they're uh, just a great example to us today. And God, I pray as they're the example to us and as uh, we just read your word, God, we just pray, Lord, that you would uh, sting us, remind us of the things that you're doing in our lives and how we can respond to the call of uh, reaching people and reaching one more for your, uh, for your name so that many will come to know Jesus. God, I pray we'd speak Jesus everywhere we go. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Go ahead and take it away, team. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thanks again, Marcus and Jennifer, for being here and your awesome kids. Um, you guys, if you don't mind, just maybe can slip out and prepare yourselves to greet uh, our families. Uh, church, as we leave today, don't just hustle off. Uh, make sure you stop and grab a prayer card, and uh, let's, let's be a blessing to this couple, to this family. Uh, there's one other thing I want to do. Uh, we have a family that is headed out uh, on a missions trip at the end of this week and will be gone for a week. It's uh, James Sr. over here. 
and James Jr. here. And then uh, where's Jude and Giovanni? Give a little wave over here. Nope, stand up, not sit down, brother. Stand up. Where's Giovanni? Oh, he's in kids' church serving. And then Jen, J Jennifer, right there. Okay, great. Um, if you're close by one of these, or you can just stretch your hands towards these fools up here. No, I'm just uh, We love you guys, and we're praying for you that God's going to really speak to you. And uh, it's the last thing James Jr. wanted me to do was to point him out. So forget that I said anything about him. Lord, I just pray that you'd bless this family as they go to Guatemala this next week. I pray that they would be most effective uh, in the work that they're called to do there. Um, and Lord, I pray that you would speak to their hearts, Lord. And uh, Lord, just in a similar way that you spoke to my heart in Mexico City, uh, Lord, speak to these boys' hearts. God, be with James Sr. and Jen as they lead their family and the, the rest of the team that will join them there at Paradise Bound. Lord, I pray that you bless them. Thank you for that. And Lord, I pray that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead will dwell in each of us, God, to be a light. And Lord, it's not just the Regan family responsible. Each of us are responsible to take your name to the lost. And Lord, I pray that you would give us opportunities this week in West Michigan, God, to make a difference. God, give us the boldness. Give us the eyes to see. Uh, help us to be that burning flame in a dark world. God, I pray that we, as we pray these things, Lord, that you would go before us, behind us, and all around us in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen and amen. We love you. Thank you so much for being here. Go in the grace of God. Thank you for listening to this week's message from the Gateway Church. If you'd like to find out more about our church, such as service times, giving, and ways to get connected, visit us at thegateway.church.